What she's saying is that beginning sometime in the 50s, uh, people began to work more and more and, and not really earn proportionally more and more. And she says that, that it's reached a point now where there, there are substantial increases in the amount of work that's, that's being done. At, at the time the 86 reform was being paid, there was, there was $6.7 billion being collected from millionaires. That has decreased down to seven-tenths. It has almost disappeared. And it disappeared with, with them knowing full well, lying to us, claiming just the opposite. But they knew that was happening. And so that just shows you that, that you, can, you can be a Democrat or you can be a Republican, but as long as you're in Congress, you're a crook. It was covered in one complete chapter of America, What Went Wrong, where it talks about how these corporate raiders and big corporations like uh, Chrysler have looted the pension funds. Essentially, we have the, the upper class in this country, the rich in this country, running it, running it to the detriment of everybody else, and being able, through the media, who are part of the rich class, covering it up, denying that such a thing is taking place, denying that there are classes in this country, denying that, that there is this extreme, wealthy, powerful group of people running the country into the ground and running it into the ground in their own benefit. The country is in a precarious economic and political situation. We discuss this with an economic consultant right now on Alternative Views. Remember, uh, several years ago, many years ago, there was, I think it was a Camel cigarette commercial that said, are you smoking more but enjoying it less? Well, that's just about the way Americans are. We're working more, enjoying life less, and getting less return on it. There have been a lot of books written recently about what has happened to the American economy, what has happened to the American people, and uh, who's done it to the American people. This is something we're going to talk about extensively on alternative views. Just what has happened to the American people and why has the economy dipped the way it has, but why have the rich gotten richer and the rest of us poorer? And what's happening to really make Americans overworked and the return much less. We have Jack Hopper with us, who uh, is our uh, economic consultant and uh, he's read uh, some books and Doug has read some books and I've read some books and hopefully we'll be able to make some sense out of what's happened. Uh, Jack, there among all these books which are actually getting a lot of attention nowadays. Back in the Reagan years they wouldn't. The one that uh, you've been uh, taking a look at is The Overworked American. Yeah, The Overworked American uh, subtitled The Unexpected Decline of Leisure by Juliet Shore has gotten it's got a, a pretty good review in the Wall Street Journal, as a matter of fact. And, uh, <laughs> that is surprising. It, uh, it, it also had a review in the, in the New York Times book review section, too. But The corporate executives must feel overworked as well. Well, it, the, the book doesn't deal with, with the reverse of this, which is the CEOs are working less and making more these days, but that's, that's exactly what's happened. Maybe it's maybe because we're going to find that the union uh, is is a, a factor here. The union has gotten weaker, uh, but there must be a CEO's union, which obviously has gotten stronger. So it's it's kind of offsetting that. Yeah, the CEO's union is called the system. It's called capitalism, right? <laughs> the roundtable, the, the business roundtable. What is what is the core thought 
of what uh, Juliet Shore is saying about the overworked American. Well, she's done some research that uh, the, the reviewers seem to agree is is uh, unusual, different, and novel, something that hasn't been done. But what she's saying is that beginning sometime in the 50s, uh, people began to work more and more and, and not really earn proportionally more and more. And she says that, that it's reached a point now where there, there are substantial increases in the amount of work that's, that's being done. She says that all American workers are, are uh, subject to this, but uh, she's, she documents and, and also says that the real one that's lost here are women. That women are now working uh, 309 hours a year longer than they used to. The average worker is working 160 some odd. The man, the male workers, work in about 93 hours, and these are a lot longer hours than than uh, European workers are working, and they're not making any more for it. There was a big changeover in, uh, I guess, in the 70s, perhaps gradually, more in the 70s and the 80s. Really, we saw it, and that is that the families had to have two incomes in order to survive. I remember back in the 50s, when I was a young man, I supported a family on 400 a month. And, but now it requires at least two incomes, sometimes three or even four. Well, that, that calls up uh, another book that we're looking at here called America, What Went Wrong, which came out of a, a long series of articles in the Philadelphia Inquirer. And one of the <clears throat> important and interesting points that came out of that was that there were 300,000 lost jobs in manufacturing during the 80s. And what's happened is you're, you're losing the high-paying jobs and you're gaining the low-paying jobs. And that's, and women, of course, uh, are always, have always been discriminated against as workers. Therefore, the women are the ones having to go into these low-paying jobs, and they can't even make it on, on one job. Some of them are, are, are working three jobs in order to make it. In fact, there's another factor here which has to do with the divorce rate and the way this is impacted on women. There's a tremendous amount of single family parents that happen to be women that are forced to support a family and thus to go out and work as well as take care of, of the family. I read statistics that as many as one out of three families in this country are single parent families in which the woman is the sole provider. So this, too, has forced uh, women into the workplace. Well, more than, than ever, I think, these women are forced to go out and get minimum wage paying jobs. And uh, there just aren't the kind of good jobs, and these people haven't had the kind of professional training that, that would carry them beyond that. So they're not just working one hour, one, one job. They're working maybe two and maybe three. <clears throat> and I think the important thing that we've got to think about is, uh, here's the quail the quail whining about family values, right. and yet why isn't he whining about the fact that these women are the ones he's talking about who are victimized by this system, and who are doing the victimizing? Well, corporate employers are doing the victimizing. Is it also the case that women are only getting paid 60% on the dollar compared to men's salaries? Now is popular, popularizing that figure as recently as a couple years ago, and I haven't seen that there's been any changes in this. That it doesn't seem to change, although I don't think uh, those kind of, of, of facts are, are in, in these books here. What, what's there is the fact that we've, we've had the loss of high paying jobs and big gain and really low paying jobs, and therefore uh, overwork is increased and payment is decreased. Okay, now why would an employer want to have his people working, say, time and a half because he has to pay them more? Well, uh, there's documentation for the fact that French benefits have gone up in the last 25 years from 17 to 35 percent of wages. Mm -hmm. So what he's trying to do is avoid bringing a new employer, employee on, putting him on a new expensive health plan, putting him on an expensive retirement plan, and he just doesn't have to do that. And uh, when he can force, when he can force his employee to work overtime, even though the employee, employee may not want to work overtime. Well, it's gone the other direction in some industries like uh, fast food, where they purposefully only hire a very few full-time employees so that they don't have to pay any of these uh, fringe benefits. Any, any fringe benefits. Yeah. Right. Well, you actually see it in the community colleges like here in Austin, where they hire almost, uh, well, mainly uh, part-time 
uh, teachers. They may teach three courses. Or five even. Or, yeah, but they don't get uh, benefits and they don't even get, they pay, you know, $1,000 a course, something like that. Well, that, that's less than minimum wage. This, this points out the fact that, that uh, there isn't any freedom to, to choose or not choose overtime, except there, there is some freedom in these low paying, entry level, minimum or less minimum wage jobs. There, of course, people can work part time, but you can't work part time in a good job because your employer won't let you. He just won't, even though, even though it may, may make economic sense, even though productivity may be equal or greater, he won't do it. And he doesn't do it because he, 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 doesn't, he just doesn't want that arrangement. Well, Shore also points out that uh, in the overworked American that the employers and the system don't want to hire a lot of people because that uh, will make the number of unemployed smaller and you have to have that uh, reserve uh, uh, unemployed army of, of people to be there as a threat to discipline the people who uh, are working and to make them uh, more docile and afraid of losing their own jobs. Well, there is the class conflict. I mean, this, this simply gets down to the fact that the wealthy, the rich, uh, the powerful, uh, economically powerful, are deliberately manipulating the system to suppress the rest of us. And they're suppressing it for their own benefits. And, and of course, uh, this has been taking place for a long time, but there's not many people saying very much about it. Uh, there is that comment in this book that that's happening that full employment is something that they, they avoid like the plague. And it's interesting to note that at the one institution all these rich people and all the powerful people want to keep their hands on is the Federal Reserve because the Fed is what keeps unemployment high. And that's what they want. How is high. that? Because they control the money supply, control interest rates, and therefore control the economy. And completely independently of Congress, of anybody else. This is totally controlled by the very small, rich establishment. Yes, people think that because of the name Federal Reserve that it's a government agency, but it's actually a private uh, uh, enterprise, as you said, controlled by just a small number of uh, bankers and people. In the, yeah, in the that, banking that's system. exactly right, and, and of course they are completely independent of, of uh, any kind of a responsibility or any kind of democratic process. And what they do, they want to keep uh, the bondholders safe, and, but they also want to keep unemployment at a high level so that there's no pressure on wages to go up because of employment problems. Jack, can we talk about the role of uh, unions or the decline of unions in the United States on these uh, facts? In Europe, for instance, where they're heavily unionized in the main European democratic countries, they have less work. The work week has gone down, the average amount of hours per week, and the vacations have gone up. In some European countries, eight to ten hours, or I'm sorry, eight to ten weeks is a standard uh, vacation, where they often get six or seven weeks straight in the summer off. And this is a result of unions and of contracts that are signed sometimes on a national level, sometimes within uh, industries. To what extent does the decline of unions in the United States impact on the working class, giving them less power and giving the capitalist class more power? Well, there's a discussion in, in the overworked American about that specifically and how that trend began to take place back in the, in the late 50s and early 60s. And as unions got weaker and the union busting became uh, the, the prevalent thing to do, then of course the worker lost any kind of, of or he lost a lot of his power and lost a lot of his control. And, uh, but there was more than that. The unions also seemed to give up the notion of reducing the work week from 40 hours. There was a time when there was a lot of talk about, hey, we finally got it down to 40 hours, let's go below that. And in, Ger in Germany now, there is a union over there that just arranged a 35-hour work right. week. And that does two things. It allows these people to have more leisure, but it also puts more people to work. And for some reason, uh, our unions gave that up, and as they got weaker, they, they quit talking about it. But uh, uh, this author, this writer here, polled 300 employers about reducing work time. Not, not below 40 hours, but below the 48 or 50 that's common. And not a single one wanted to do it. They all rejected the idea. So the employers are trying to do two things. Reduce wages, but work the worker to death. And, and uh, Shore goes on to point out that 
to the extent that women are the ones that are victimized in this process the most, and to the extent that they're away from their children at home, and to the extent that they, they're harassed at home when they do get home, think of all the problems that are, that are flowing out of this. Children not learning at school, children, latchkey children uh, out on the streets, the drug problem. These are all flowing from this fact that women are having to work more than, than, than they need to or they want to and they can't avoid it in order to make enough money to feed their kids, but they can't do all that, th that they should do for their kids. And that doesn't even address the fact of the stress factor in all this. The, the uh, mother and the father, if, even if there is a nuclear family, are so much under the gun, they're not liable to be very nice people when they get home well, from that's work. right, and the children suffer because of that, <clears throat> too. And this is exactly what Dan Quayle is leaving out of the discussion in his talk about family values, <laughs> as if it's just a question of values as opposed to economic forces that are tearing apart the uh, family. Well, I think Mr. Quayle should have talked about uh, how bad uh, these, these effects are on women and how the, the, the business roundtable ought to be doing something about it and how maybe they're at fault for it. The, uh, let's go back a little bit historically. We were talking about no countervailing uh, uh, pressure or power in the form of unions. Uh, and you were talking about how the unions have become weak. Actually, the destruction of the more radical unions uh, with the IWW, the Wobblies, at the uh, turn of the century and the first decade of the century, and like the Knights. The Knights of Labor were busted yeah. right here in Texas in, in the 1850s by Jay Gu uh, with the railroads. I mean, he, he ruined that union. And by ruining the, the Knights of Labor, he ruined the union movement for another 50 years. And, and therefore, mm -hmm. uh, we saw very little change in the long, horrendous working hours of working men until the turn of the century. People don't realize how the 40-hour uh, work is uh, just a very recent phenomenon. The, the 1880s, it was common to have 70-hour weeks, uh, seven days a week. People had no, no time off at all, and they worked, they worked 10 and 12 hours a day. I yeah. think it was the steel workers, wasn't it, that uh, they worked six days a week, but in order to get uh, that seventh day off, they had to work 24 hours straight? Well, when they had a turnaround, they did work 24 yeah. hours straight. And, and they worked in very dangerous, very, very bad conditions. Too. Well, this is what is so distressing about the continuation of the 40-hour work week. For about 30 years, from about 1880s through 1910, there was marked reduction in the work week as a result of struggle by the unions, but also political struggle. Within the political parties, there was action to lessen legislation, to lessen the hours of the work week. So you saw it going down from 70 to 60 to 50 to 40, but it stayed sent to 40 for decades now. And there's been no movement, either within Congress or the labor movement, to give workers a break on this. Well, the, the movement down seemed to, to get into ferment during World War II. Uh, it had moved down. The labor movement uh, found a friend in, in the Democratic Party in the 30s and, and uh, developed a little bit of authority, a little bit of, of power during that time and worked their way down to that 40-hour week. And then during the war, of course, things changed. And I don't think they ever got back to the notion again. I think during the war, the, the, I think uh, industry used that as an excuse to press unions. I know they were trying to bust all sorts of labor unions during the war because of strikes. And the result was that the notion of continuing to, de to decrease the working hours seemed to have uh, evaporated as a goal. Jack, there's an interesting observation in uh, a review of this book, The Overworked American, in dollars and cents. And it says over the 40-year period from the Second World War until now, American economic progress in the form of productivity growth gave us a nation of opportunity to cut back the work time in half if we wanted to do this. So we can now produce our 1948 standard of living in less than half the time it took back then. So we could have a 20-hour week, or we could have people working uh, one year on and one year off. But if we look at the 70 or 80 years before 40, 1948, there's a dramatic decline in working hours. But anyway, their point is that the production has increased, the technology has increased and all so that we could have the same standard of living, which was okay back in 1948, if we wanted to. But 
people may or may not have the choice to uh, use this and do it this way. Well, the shore makes the point that they didn't have the choice, but there's something else added into this that we haven't talked about, and it is that we developed, industry has developed this advertising business and the consumerism business and the high debt kind of thing for workers to the point where workers get trapped, uh, Shore calls it a, a, a treadmill, and they get on the treadmill of spending and, and they've got to work to pay their debts. And so uh, they've, they've got into this notion of consume, consume, a shop till you drop. That kind of business has been fostered on us by these same employers because through the, through the advertising process, they have, have, have created these wants that people have so that even if people would like to, and the evidence shows that they would like to work less, they can't because they've got bills to pay, they've got things, responsibilities, and so they, they're forced to stay on this, this treadmill just like a squirrel. Yeah, I, I wanted to come back to this technology issue because during the 1950s and the 1960s and all the sociological treatises on the technological society, there was almost a promise that technology is going to reduce human labor power, so therefore there's going to be less work. There are even some alarmist analyses that technology was going to cause tremendous technological unemployment and this could lead to a crisis in the system. What is the role of technology in here? We see in many different industries there's been robotization or automization of the assembly line. We've seen a lot of computerization of a lot of tasks. So there's no question that technology is doing more and more work, but yet this has not led to a decrease in human labor time. Indeed, there's been an increase. So why is this the case? Well, what's happening is that, that you're having decreases in specific uh, labor requirements, but we're having an internationalization of, of, uh, of employment. And, and as I said earlier, there's evidence here that we've lost 300,000 manufacturing jobs. That's where the technology is located. There's not any new technology in flipping hamburgers or in sweeping, sweeping out uh, uh, stores or making up beds for motels. There's no technology increase there. So what's happened is that the technology has been decreasing jobs, but the jobs themselves also have been going overseas. And therefore, we haven't been taking advantage or we haven't been able to take advantage. But to the area, in the areas where the technology has increased productivity, the employer has not given workers the choice of either taking uh, uh, the same hours and, and a little bit less pay. They've made them work overtime. Isn't there something else involved, though, too, of a psychological nature that she points out in her book? And that is that people have, are so stressed out and get so little enjoyment from work that the pleasure they get in life is from buying commodities. And they buy these things, and then they find that there's not enjoyment in that, so they need to buy something else. Yeah, and she puts a lick on economists, most of whom are mostly whores for the system. <laughs> and uh, for the most part, what they're, what they're claiming is it's all objective and an economic man can, can have no end to his wants. Well, that's ridiculous. Whether he wants to pay another 100 bucks for another VCR or 200 for another VCR, he's doing all those things. But who knows that he really wants to do it? Uh, behind all this, of course, is a, certain, is a whole lot of pressure to... Uh, to be unhappy about what he's got, to be uneasy about the system, and, and maybe to find an escape in all this. But all the polls show that this is not a material society. People don't choose those things if they have alternatives. What it looks like to me is happening is they don't have alternatives. The fact of trying to make Americans uh, work longer hours, uh, we had an interview with uh, uh, former Secretary of Labor Ray Marshall, and he was saying, if you're going to start trying to compete in hours worked and uh, low-level wages, then we're going to lose anyway. Uh, and then the, uh, say, I guess is yeah, the Wall Street Journal in their um, review of the overworked American has said that uh, uh, Americans will still lose this battle. The Japanese are on a six-day schedule, and of course we know they spend a heck of a lot of overtime. They don't work on eight-hour day; they're down there day and night. And the Koreans spend three or four Sundays in the factory, and uh, th they don't get the uh, vacation time or the uh, holidays off. Uh, 
Americans spend an average eight more weeks a year in the factory, however, than do Germans, and 11 more weeks than the Swedes. Yeah, I, I see a lot of this quoting of, of the Japanese and, and uh, glossing over the Europeans, who, who are our, our natural comparisons. But uh, there was a piece in the paper not too long ago about this rent-a-family in which the Japanese uh, salaryman works so many hours he can't visit his family and he hires actors to go in and act like they are him and, and uh, have a relationship with his family who he can't see because he's too busy. Is that, is that the goal of America? To be so crazy like the Japanese that you commute four hours to work and four hours back and you party uh, with, with customers the rest of the time and you never see your family? Uh, well, that's the direction we're going here, except that the direction also is going that the payment is even less than they're getting. At least they're getting paid pretty well for it. What, what about uh, these new technologies and work at home? Alan Toffler, in his book, The Third Wave, claimed that there was going to be a decentralization of labor, that more and more people would be working at home through computers. More and more people would be living in rural neighborhoods or rural regions where there would be small businesses around so they wouldn't have to com uh, uh, commute. Is this trend actually materializing or is this only a fantasy of these sort of technological utopian dreamers? Toffler was claiming that this is actually a trend that is now moving forward and that this is actually happening. Is there any evidence that this is the case or well, there may be a, a tr if you start with zero and you increase a little bit, I mean, there's a big percentage increase. But in terms of, certainly in terms of high-paying jobs, I don't see that happening at all because you, you, it's true that writers and certain other specialists can work at home, but not many other people can. And certainly the high-paying uh, mass jobs, manufacturing, can't be done that way. So I, I don't know that that we have any kind of possibility of alleviating this problem that way. Well, let's talk about something we haven't really mentioned yet, the political parties and the role of the political system in this. It seems that one of the reasons why the Americans are overworked is not just, and overexploited, is not just the decline of the union movement, but the decline of the Democratic Party as a party that represents working people's interests to become just another corporate party that's controlled by big corporate money that is not carrying out an agenda that's going to advance the interests of um, working people here. In other words, in the political system, we haven't really gotten any help well, in terms of working conditions. We got the just the opposite. We've got the Democrats uh, playing right into the hands of, of the people that they're supposed to be opposing. Uh, America, What Went Wrong shows that the 1986 tax reform in which the Democrats made a big production out of raising the taxes on millionaires, just the opposite happened. And not only did the opposite happen, but the Democrats knew when they passed these laws that the opposite were going to happen. Uh, at, at the time the 86 reform was being paid, there was, there was $6.7 billion being collected from millionaires. That has decreased down to seven-tenths. It has almost disappeared. And it disappeared with, with them knowing full well, lying to us, claiming just the opposite. But they knew that was happening. And so that just shows you that, that you, can, you can be a Democrat or you can be a Republican, but as long as you're in Congress, you're a crook. And that's what the public seems to think right now, with good reason. Yes, this, this is an incredible book, America, What Went Wrong? And I would suggest everybody read it. It'll make you mad. Uh, but along with the, the companion book here of Juliet Shore, you can really get a quick idea of what has been happening to you and I and the country, uh, not just after with Reagan, although it accelerated under Reagan, it actually started under Carter and maybe a little before. But this Tax Reform Act is very, is very key because it not only uh, let the millionaires off the hook drop down, what, what is it now there? tax rate, 31% or 20%, yeah, 31%, right. whereas it was as high theoretically, according to the law, 50 up to, up to 90, yeah, 90, 90 at one time. Yeah. But it allowed the corporations to do a whole bunch of things which they couldn't do before. Well, their tax rate was lower too, but the whole question was, 
where were the promises of the incentive that was going to result from those lower tax rates? Well, that was all a lie. I mean, it was, it was just all a lie. And it's resulted in the corporate taxes, the percentage of corporate taxes being paid has dropped from about 30, 32 percent in the 50s down to about 17 percent now. So if they don't pay it, that means we do. And there are some other things about this taxes. The foreign companies that operate in the United States don't have to pay any income tax in the United States to us, even though they get their profits from here. Or an American company, like for instance a shipping company, it's all run and operated out of the United States, but they license it in Panama. That company doesn't have to pay any uh, well, income tax. Doug, the, the notion that the, that the public is having a belly full of the political system is coming from the awareness of the public that nobody paid. Uh, the rich people's uh, taxes were lifted. Uh, the poor people's taxes weren't lifted. They just weren't raised. But we had this horrible long-term deficit. I mean, we had this tremendous deficit. In addition, we had this, this notion that uh, the, the government can take over all sorts of private debts, and that can, that can uh, go forward because it's indefinite. And so what I think you find is the public waking up to the fact that long term they've been screwed. Right. And therefore, uh, the Democrats and Republicans alike have been screwing them, not being responsible. And, and I think what, they've, what they see is that we somehow or other have lost a social contract that we've had in this country. All other decent countries have social contracts. The banana republics don't. We don't have one now, and we're a banana republic. That's all we are right now. Uh, I got mine, Jack. Screw you. And hooray for me, because I've got mine. We used to have a social contract in which all Americans participated and, and got some benefits. We've lost all that. And I, and I guess we lost it mainly during the Reagan administration when it was a, they, were, they were encouraged to do all this kind of things, and, and we broke that social contract. There's many features of this breaking of the social contract on behalf of both the political and the economic system. For instance, in the economic system, you have corporations who systematically fire people that reach a certain level simply so they don't have to pay the unemployment, not the unemployment, but the retirement benefits. They have to pay a certain amount of more money after the employees have been in a certain amount of years, so they fire them before that time comes. Or they shut down the plant in Detroit or in Boston and they move it to Manila or to the border of Mexico to get cheap uh, labor. So people that thought they had lifetime employment as well as a guaranteed economic future have found out that they don't because these corporations are simply interested in the bottom line and will thus do anything to increase profit at the expense of their employers. And, and those are the corporations that haven't been merged or went out of business. The ones that emerged and went out of business had the raiders, the Wall Street crooks, taking over those pension funds, raiding those pension funds, recasting those pension funds, and, and setting up annuities with busted insurance companies so that, that the poor people that didn't stay with the company. Now, some of those, those companies uh, have recently, uh, in, in court actions, been found guilty of firing these people at, at right before they got to their 20 years. But, but even there, there are, are those people that, that still have some pensions. But then there are the others where the pension uh, arrangements have just sort of disappeared. Well, this has been, uh, it was covered in one complete chapter of America, What Went Wrong, where it talks about how these corporate raiders and big corporations like uh, Chrysler have looted the pension funds. Now, the pension funds say, well, that isn't, the, uh, uh, that isn't anything to do with the employee. That's just extra gravy. But the corporations always consider that as part of the wage or salary that somebody gets. You get this salary because you're also getting some of the pension fund. But now, during the Reagan administration, they said that if a corporation, if a corporate chief executive officer says that uh, the pension fund is is more than adequate if they have a surplus according to the CEO then he can take that and use it for whatever he wants and he may even set up an annuity which is not guaranteed by anything and also gives the workers a lot less so you have these corporate raiders as well as established 
corporations, looting the uh, funds, the pension fund, and then buying other corporations with it, speculating and when junk bonds and all this type of thing, or lining their own pockets so that the workers, after spending their whole lives to these companies, they may they will have nothing. Or maybe maybe here here's two hundred fifty dollars, or maybe a thousand dollars. That's your lifetime pension, There's and this is happening all over the country. There's a related uh, f pension fund uh, problem, and that is in the high speculative atmosphere of the Reagan and Bush uh, years, a lot of them have gone out of business. I just got a memo from the University of Texas that three of the national pension teacher retirement companies have gone out of business, and these are not federally insured. In the state of Texas, your unemployment benefits are insured, but only up to $100,000. So if you have more than that in your program, as most people do, when they work more than, say, 10 or 15 years, then you just simply lose this. All of the money wow. that you thought was going to be your retirement money that was going to be your pension fund for the future has disappeared. And it's, there's simply no uh, unemployment federal insurance to take care of that. Even though you contribute some Even of Even though yourself. you have contributed. I contribute 7% of my paycheck every month to this, and I could lose it all if my, un, my uh, retirement program goes bust. And at least three that have worked with the University of Texas have. And so this is happening all over the country. Well, you can bet that when Lee Iacocca retired from Chrysler <laughs> and got his $6 million in his last year as payment, uh, you can bet that, that he has a consulting contract that will last for the next five or six years. You can bet that his retirement was very carefully arranged for. Uh, there was no problem there with any shortage at Chrysler with, for Lee Iacocca. Now, the fact that Lee Iacocca didn't, didn't handle his business for the rest of the workers, I guess, is beside the point. This? Yes, there was something like $2.6 billion shortfall in the Chrysler uh, retirement fund, uh, pension fund right now. But some of this is guaranteed by the government, just like the um, FDIC and F -L FSLIC for the uh, banks and the savings and loans. So the taxpayers may wind up picking up the cost of a lot of this. There's an interesting fact that just occurred to me that we haven't brought up yet. And that is the middle class is now getting screwed and exploited just like the working class. In the United States from the 1950s through the 1980s, the middle class had it pretty well. The, basically their standard of living was going up. They had fairly secure jobs. They had a fairly secure future with retirement and pension funds, etc. But now the middle class too is under assault here. They're losing jobs that they thought were guaranteed. They're losing, uh, they're losing unemployment and health benefits. As soon as you lose your job, sometimes you can't even afford to have health insurance anymore. And then if your pension and retirement fund goes under, you're finished. So even middle class people who previously had been beneficiaries of the system, who had generally prospered in the United States for many decades after World War II, are now getting hit as hard as the previous industrial working class. Well, that's, that's right. And for the most part, that's, that's been the case through most of history. But it's also the case that the rich and the employers have suppressed the notion that we have a class battle here and tried to avoid it by either covering it up with a race battle or with some other kind of professionalism or some other story. Essentially, we have the, the upper class in this country, the rich in this country, running it running it to the detriment of everybody else and being able through the media who are part of the rich class covering it up denying that such a thing is taking place denying that there are classes in this country denying that that there is this extreme wealthy powerful group of people running the country into the ground and running it into the ground in their own benefit and uh, it's just something that that the, the rest of the public doesn't seem to want to be aware of this, it certainly seems, is the moment for populism in the American political arena 
that basically the populist line has been precisely this for decades, that it's basically the rich that are screwing the people, and it's just a question of organizing the people to get government to serve the interests of the people rather than the wealthy. That should be the goal of political activity. Which brings us to the current election, where it seems like there's an incredible amount of people that are dissatisfied with the system. Bush's ratings are going down weekly. Clinton has never really caught on with the public. But what is really striking here is the disaffection of the people with the political system itself, with the political establishment, with both the Democratic, the Republican Party, with both Congress and the presidency, where there's real anger out there. So people are aware that they are getting screwed over by the system. It's just that they're not being given any real political alternatives with the possible exception of Ross Perot, who has exploited these populist sentiments, claiming that he's the outsider candidate, that he's the one that's going to come in and shake things up and return democracy to the United States, et cetera. Well, that's right. Of course, we're looking for the man on horseback. Right. And here he is. Oh, but dangerous. Re yeah. But remember that Carter right. was, a, was, a, was a man outside of the system. Even though he was a Democrat, he was outside the system. We put him in, and we lost interest in him. Reagan was a man outside of the system, an outsider. We put him in, and we lost faith in him. Uh, and now, I guess we're turning to somebody that's so far out that, that it scares the hell out of everybody, so they, they just are willing to take take a risk. And, and yet, this man is no outsider. Obviously, this man uh, has made a fortune off the public with these Medicare, Medicaid kind of, uh, of, of uh, working arrangements with computers. And yet, uh, the public seems to be willing to take some kind of a chance just as long as it is, is a clean alternative. Uh, not that that's very clean, but it is a, certainly an alternative. Yes, the Germans were presented with this back in the 30s, weren't they? When well, Hitler, Hitler came right, Adolf rode in on a horseback. But it is interesting that the Perot phenomenon expresses the depth of alienation and the extent to which people are fed up with the system. And I would say the desperation in looking for alternatives, looking for solution, salvation, actually. By the way, I saw a pro speech for the first time last night on C-SPAN. The, the whole speech was taped, and it was basically just one, one liner after the other. He obviously had a very good speechwriter. And they're all promises. Zingers. They, they were all criticisms of what was wrong, and then sort of vague promises without any substance uh, whatsoever. So the tragedy of the present moment, it seems to me, is that there's not a genuine populist movement in the United States that really represents the interests of the people and really has a program to do something to serve the interests of the people and to change the power structure of this country because obviously the moment is ripe for change. Obviously people want change and I think people see that things are profoundly wrong with this country, with the system, and they're looking for change. But who's offering it? Well, Ross Perot is not offering it. <laughs> Jack, you know, there was something that uh, it, it strikes me uh, so frequently, but after uh, when reading this America, What Went Wrong by Barlett and Steele, and you see how, the, uh, how Americans have been so trampled by this latest, by the latest depredations of the uh, capitalists, uh, uh, looting of the pension funds, the uh, kicking people out of work. The SNL a with, disaster going to cost two trillion dollars. Yeah, now. all of this and th these corporate raiders coming in and destroying people's lives, destroying good companies, and then moving on, uh, enriching themselves, and the meanwhile, uh, doing anything that to uh, to to make money, regardless of who is hurt. And it always makes me wonder: is capitalism bring out the worst in people or the worst people are the most successful as capitalists? It just seems horrible what, to what you read about. Well, you hate to bring up Marx, <laughs> but Marx was mainly a historian and a, a poor predictor, but a good historian. And he, he, made, he at least made some analogies. And, and uh, it's, it's, it's the truth that capitalism is designed to accumulate funds. And uh, it doesn't care who it hurts or what, it, you know, what, what the effects are. And the effects in this country have gone beyond hurting people. Uh, we're now coming to terms with it in terms of the environment and other kinds of social costs that, that the, the capitalist system is in, incapable of dealing with. 
And uh, that's, I guess that's what we're going to have to integrate into a capitalist system to make it, to make it human. Well, even uh, Adam Smith recognized this. He didn't have any high opinion of uh, businessmen themselves. And he said when they get together that they were greedy, that they would try to uh, squash each other and take advantage of people as well as best they could. But his way of saying the only discipline he could find would be the free market, that would the competition would discipline the capitalists and keep their uh, worst impulses at least at bay and maybe and work to the benefit of people. However, when Reagan and the boys uh, did this, took the regulations off during the 80s, we found it just uh, did the opposite. It destroyed ton, you know, so many good companies. Joblessness was created because of this. Bankruptcies, debt, uh, and the dismantling of the U.S. economy. So uh, just the free enterprise system uh, running unfettered. Well, it's uh, running amok, but what's even worse is the free enterprise system moved into politics so that you had an economic factor running politics. Who had the money could buy the politicians and could buy the policies. And uh, that's, that's relatively new. The PAC system allowed that to take place, but, but the, the Japanese are in there buying their share of it, too. So now we, we not only have a market system in, in economics, we have a market system in politics. And I think the compounding of these two is what, what's making people so cynical. Yet I would argue that this whole notion of free enterprise and even a market system is something of a myth. That basically we have a corporate system where big corporations control the economy through controlling prices and demand, through advertising, through simply the amount of concentrated wealth that they have means that in most industries they can manipulate the economic process. And particularly under Reagan and Bush, these same corporate forces have taken over the state and used the state to carry out their own policies, which involve a lot of welfare for the rich. I mean, the whole military-industrial complex is incredible state socialism, and there's nothing free market or competition about this uh, sector, the way that production takes place, prices are established, etc. And likewise, the media, the big corporations under Reagan were able to take over the big television networks. Time and Warner were able to develop new conglomerates. So that basically what you have is not a free enterprise system where there's genuine competition or a genuine market, but you have corporate forces taking over the economy, taking over the state, taking over the media, and thus using all of these domains for their own interests. Well, you've had these dingbat academic economists for the last 40 years trying to figure out how you can readjust the description of the, of the capitalist system, the free enterprise system, to fit ours. And you had oligopoly, and you had all sorts of, of uh, monopolistic competition and whatnot. But essentially, you've still got industries like f the pharmaceuticals, who are the, the epitome of what you're talking about. They don't compete. They, they make exorbitant profits. And they get unbelievable government subsidies. And they don't, they, they don't do the job. They don't compete. And they get all kinds of tax breaks, et cetera. And, and this is, I think, typical of the economy. Well, it, a it's corporate. It, yes, and take it a step further. GM was an example of that. And it got so hidebound. And, and, and for one, one example, there was somebody able to come in and actually compete with them. It turned out to be the Japanese. And what happened? They floundered for 15 years. And ended up imitating the Japanese. Well, right. In the case of the U.S. Steel. The U.S. Steel decided to get the hell out of the steel business because they were too incompetent to make steel. You know, it's interesting. There's been all this literature and debate about the end of communism and how communism hasn't worked. I think equally the last couple of decades have indicated that a certain form of capitalism doesn't work and that basically we need new ideas for our economy, for our political system, and that the lesson, again, of the last couple of decades is none of the old orthodoxies work. A centralized command economy such as you had in the Soviet Union and communist systems obviously doesn't work. And the U.S. model has also proved to be very dubious and questionable in its effects of the last. Well, I've wondered what, what we tell the, the, the Poles and the Czechs and the Hungarians and now the Russians uh, about our system. I mean, they think they're getting a democratic system like ours. Uh, that's the last thing that ours is, is a democratic system.
And the last thing most of them want, if you followed uh, people on the street interviews, which were going on uh, uh, several months ago that they would have in, in the street, that they don't want American capitalism. They want the benefits of socialism, but with the more freedom and freedom of opportunities that uh, some type of uh, a free enterprise will allow. You know, we've been talking about books here. I think that there's a good tie-in with three books. I remember it came out in the, uh, in the 70s. Uh, one was business and ethics, which is a very good one to talk about, because it was completely uh, had interviews with some of the top executives and bankers, and it was then they were concerned about the American people. They're saying the American people aren't working hard enough, they're paid too much, and they're getting uppity in the political system. They're demanding too much, so we have to have more depressions, we have to have more un unemployment and lower wages, so that people will not have the energy to go out and challenge the system. The only thing they didn't add was we need more slave labor camps. <laughs> That's yeah. the only thing missing. <laughs> then there was that famous book, Crisis of Democracy which is difficult to find now, was the first book by the Trilateral Commission, the David Rockefeller's elite organization, where it said that capitalism and democracy are incompatible. Nobody ever stopped to think about that too much before in those areas, but they actually are. They, you can't have a lot of democracy in order to ha have the capitalists being able to do what they want. So they said we have to have less democratic participation. We have to have uh, less media coverage of what we were doing because they recognized and they're scared to death of the American people because American people were very violent. And so they recognized that the labor unions uh, could have caused a lot of trouble, uh, causing trouble in the uh, Great Depression. They were afraid that they would lose control of the system, the capitalists were. And then they were also afraid of the labor movement back in the late 1800s, early 1900s. They were afraid of the peace movement. They were afraid of the civil rights movement. So they had to devise some additional controls to keep the uh, Americans from becoming activists again. And then the third book is Strike by Jeremy Brecker, which shows the history of resistance to the capitalists on the part of workers and shows just what the American workers did over the years. And it was only through these struggles that they were able to exact some concessions from the capitalists, which brings us around to the overworked American where they say because the American workers are quiet, more quiescent, and because the American labor unions aren't doing their job, the capitalists uh, and the system and the upper class have been able to do exactly what we've been talking about. Well, to that, the that's right, but I want to bring us back to the fact that it's women. It's women that are being exploited more than anybody else. And, and they, if this book doesn't say anything else, it shows the plight of, of the woman who's had to move out of the house to support her family and who's being overworked and underpaid. And uh, she's the one that, 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 that offers a revolution now because women are beginning to be aware of the fact that they're exploited. But I think uh, this is an example of, of the fact that, that, that the changes in women's circumstances isn't very well known. But this book ought to help. Help people know well, that. women seem to know about this because they're becoming much more active politically. In California, for instance, there's two women that are running for state uh, senator out there, or for the senator of the United States out there, and who are doing a tremendous job in mobilizing women who are fed up with the system, who are also underrepresented politically. I mean, this came out clearly in the Clarence Thomas hearings, where you had a state uh, federal judiciary committee that was dealing with the issue of sexual harassment it was all men who obviously couldn't really have any feeling <laughs> or experience in this um, regard. I want to come back to this issue about uh, capitalism and democracy as two of the main constituents of the American experience. I published a book called Television and the Crisis of Democracy where I argued that it's basically been capitalism that's been triumphant over the last several decades and has really damaged severely democracy that as we have more and more capitalism that is the business class controlling more and more of the society the people control less and less and therefore that is a threat to democracy I see basically two features of democracy one a separation of powers this was the federal system of government and Montesquieu the, the English Constitution and the American Re Revolution established that you'd separate power between the executive, the legislature, the judiciary, the media, and so on. Whereas if you have a corporate class that is controlling more and more of the power, economically, politically, culturally, this is not a democratic system. This is moving against 
a separation of power. And secondly, democracy involves sovereignty of the people, where the people themselves have power. Well, if the people are not informed by the media, if they're not given a chance to participate in the political and economic and social processes of the day, then there's less and less sovereignty of the people and more and more corporate control. And that's the trend that I see. Well, once again, it, you're back to the notion of the loss of the social contract. Because it, as long as there's no social contract, as long as the business roundtable and the rich and the corporate uh, executives and the employers feel no responsibility for the rest of the country, meaning there's no social contract, then they're going to be pushing for full control and, and reduced control or uh, participation by anybody else. Don't the authors of these two books we've been talking about, The Overworked American and America, What Went Wrong, don't they say that the only thing that's going to turn this around will be uh, an enormous restructuring and uh, replanning of things, uh, even to a greater dis uh, extent than the New Deal was? Well, I don't know that either one of these uh, have very many prescriptions. Uh, they're, they're mostly describing what's taking place and not what to do about it. But uh, John Kenneth Galbraith has a new book that deals with this, and, and I think uh, there, there are others that, that describe the system, and I think they all uh, look to local community politics as the resurgence of, of democracy at the so-called grassroots level. Uh, but I, I see here in Austin it being perverted by the, by the Barton Creek arrangement. We've got Freeport McMoran coming in, buying everybody. We've got uh, all sorts of, of power being exercised by the local Chamber of Commerce on the same basis. Uh, it's true that they don't, they don't have it alone, but if you look at the, the nuclear process we went through for the last 10 or 15 years, we had opposition to that, and they lost, and the establishment won, and they were wrong, and uh, they, they never have to pay the price for being wrong. And so it looks like a lot of these people are giving up at the national level, only concentrating at the local level. I see a lot of that in people who I hear speeches or discussions or books. They're just turning the playing field, the national playing field, over to them and say, okay, let them have it. Well, then, no, they're turning them over to people like Ross Perot. Uh, That's what's happening. <laughs> what they're saying is that I don't like the political system, I'm not political, but I want an answer and I want a man on horseback. That's dangerous. And that's Alternative Views for this time. I'd like to thank our crew who helped make our program possible. Our director was Brian Lynch, and our camera people were David Holmes and Kim McCargill.